end the other conversations quickly. So uh, one of the folks I want to introduce, actually I'll start out with this, a couple more staff members because uh, we're staff and it'll be okay if you don't hear our names. But um, we have uh, one person, Dr. Jim Zonizer, who's one of our staff members over here. He's working with the Institute. He's one of our leads in the area of smart justice, so he'll be a contact for you all who want to talk with us more about these issues. We also have uh, Dr. Peter Selby, who is a child psychologist, our lead in the area of children's mental health. Along with him is Ms. Suki Martinez-Parham, who's one of our policy uh, leads in the area of children's mental health. So we've got a great team assembled to be able to kind of pull things together at the Institute. Um, we also have a lot of our leaders here today. I'd like, um, you'll see some folks who have little yellow flags on their, uh, on their, uh, their badges. Uh, those are our collaborative uh, council members. Would you mind standing, folks who are our collaborative council members, just so we can thank you for the work you do, representing different constituents, making sure we actually do real things as opposed to write reports or talk or all that kind of stuff. Um, I also want to acknowledge two people from the Meadows Foundation, Mr. Bruce Esterline, who's the Vice President for Grants, who without his leadership on this, this would not happen, and with him, Ms. Cindy Patrick, who um, is one of the program officers who is in charge there of mental health, the strategic plan that, that put this idea on the map came from Cindy, and I just want to acknowledge both of them and thank them for their leadership on this. All right, our final panel this morning focuses on the children of Texas. And our policy priority here is, is actually similarly simple. And you know, let me just maybe illustrate it this way. If my son was an adolescent and had severe mental health needs, um, and I hope this doesn't offend any of the other institutions in Texas, but the place that I would most want him to get treatment based on my friends who've had folks serve there is the Menninger Clinic in, uh, in Houston. It's an amazing place. Um, and there's other amazing places, but that's the one <laughs> where I would probably send my son. Now, if I sent my son there, there's a very good chance my insurance wouldn't pay for it. I would take out a mortgage. I would have to do a lot of other things because it's extremely expensive to take on the kind of treatment to treat a severe mental illness with a state-of-the-art program like that. Not as expensive as some of the other societal impacts, but it's expensive. My second choice, if I couldn't do that, if I didn't have the money to do that, would be to try to get my son arrested in Dallas. <laughs> and I'm serious, because if he got arrested in Dallas, and he had severe mental health needs, he would have a very good chance of getting access to some of the programs that Mike Griffiths and others built when they were there and are continued to be sustained there to get multi-systemic treatment, to get some of the other evidence-based practices that are state-of-the-art, and the most likely place you're going to get those if you're an adolescent in Texas is in the juvenile justice system. And that's cool, but it would be cooler if we could get services like that without getting arrested, if we had different eligibility criteria, and that's what today's panel is about. We have other eligibility criteria for getting services like parental relinquishment to the foster care system, um, but what we're going to talk about today is, is very a very simple thing. How do we get behavioral health care to kids when they go to their family doctor? How do we continue to help teachers? Uh, Sandra Nix is here from the TEA. I saw there's a lot of folks working at TEA and in schools across the state to try to implement Senate Bill 460, which is to help teachers identify children with mental health needs. Question is, once teachers identify them, they need somewhere for those children to go. And a lot of times those children have parents. So getting all those folks, um, the treatment they need is what this panel is about today. So let me introduce the, the members of this panel. We are honored to have Representative Four Price chairing the panel today. Representative Price's first session was in 2011, and during his first term as a state representative, he successfully passed the law landmark legislation addressing the safety of public school athletes, emphasizing brain health and concussion prevention. House Bill 2038, known as Natasha's Law, won praise as one of the most comprehensive state laws in the nation designed to protect public school athletes. Representative Price is a member of the Appropriations Committee. He serves on the Health and Human Services Subcommittee, which analyzes and makes recommendations regarding the budget for state health care agencies. He is also was recently appointed to serve as vice chair of the Sunset Advisory Commission. And this year, a major scope, as you've heard, of the commission's work consists of reviewing our health and human service agencies. Um, his legislative work has resulted in many honors, and we're just thrilled, Representative Price, to have you here today. Um, he is joined um, by, rep, uh, by, well, people are seeing it in a different order, so I'm going to move <laughs> things around, uh, by Sonia Gaines. Um, Ms. Gaines is the Associate <laughs> Commissioner for Mental Health Services with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Sonia is responsible for coordinating the policy and delivery of mental health services across the, the whole state enterprise, so she just has a little tiny job. 
Um, and she even get to hire one person to help her with that. So it's amazing that Sonia's <laughs> taking that on. Previously, Sonia served as Chief of Mental Health Services at Tarrant County, second largest community mental health center in Texas. Um, and uh, we are just so fortunate to have her in a leadership position in our state. There's nobody I know who knows more about how to make things work for Texans and, and mental health and Texas children than Sonia. Uh, sitting beside her is Dr. Anu Partap. She is the clinical director of the foster care clinics at the Children's Medical Center in Dallas, and she's an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Texas Southwestern's Medical Center. She is a pediatrician. Um, she comes with a wealth of experience previously in Arizona and now here in Dallas, and her career has been dedicated to improving health care through program development, research and family violence prevention, injury prevention, health services, promotion of school readiness, and integrated mental health and primary care. And we are thrilled to have her here sharing her experience and what's work, uh, what she's seen work and what she's working on. Um, we're also honored to have Representative Richard Raymond here today, representing the House District 42 in Laredo. Uh, Representative Raymond chairs the House Human Services Committee and is a member of the Sunset Commission. Before becoming chairman of the Human Services Committee, Representative Raymond served several terms on the Appropriations Committee, including as vice chairman. He has made economic development, public and higher education, transportation, water, health care, and border security priority issues during his tenure, and we appreciate your, your leadership, sir. Um, and finally, we have at uh, the end, um, Judge Specia. Judge John Specia has been the commissioner of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services since December 1st, 2012, and in that position, he is responsible for the care of our state's most vulnerable children, and we're very appreciative to have you here. Um, he was a founding member and jurist in residence for the Texas Supreme Court Children's Commission, as uh, Justice Heck mentioned before. He helped establish the Bear County Children's Court, which provides specialized services for children. He was vice chair of the Supreme Court's Permanent Judicial Commission for Children, Youth and Families, and chair of the Supreme Court Task Force on Foster Care, and brings us a, a wealth of experience to share today. So I'm going to let this wonderful panel speak, and Representative Price, I'll turn things over to you, sir. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here, and it's an honor to, to chair this panel of such distinguished uh, members. I really think there are three reasons why I'm here. First is you know, children are so important to the future of the state of Texas. Um, it's cliche to say that, that children are our future, but certainly we ignore an issue as significant as mental health and children's mental health to our peril. If we don't focus on that now, we're going to pay the, the cost of that, not only socially, but economically in, in, in our communities in the future. So I'm, I think first and foremost, that's, that's, the, that's the reason why I'm here, because I have an interest in it. I come by it naturally being a father to four children. But secondly, Tom Luce asked. And so I have to say, it's really hard to say no to Tom Luce. And, and the third reason is uh, one of my daughters, my youngest daughter, is taking the SAT as we speak. So I figured this would be a good environment for me to get some parental anxiety counseling <laughs> after, the, uh, after the lunch this afternoon. But wanted to, uh, to kind of, you know, just underscore a couple of things we've heard today. Um, certainly, you know, both on the first panel and the second, uh, we, we saw a, a huge um, emphasis on collaboration, collaboration among different stakeholders, what that means, and I think we're, we're in no different situation when it comes to mental health as it relates to kids. Um, I read recently that one in five children have a diagnosable mental health disorder in our country, and one in ten has a, a problem serious enough that it interferes with their life and their functioning at home and in school but an estimated 75 to 80 percent are left untreated. So obviously there's a huge problem or disconnect between um, diagnosis in some cases and, and treatment, early intervention, which I want to talk about with the panelists and, and how productive and, and effective that can be. Um, in, in the legislative process, uh, which is my perspective, uh, we look at it on, on Article 2 and appropriations about what money can be spent and how do we prioritize our wants versus our needs. And, and obviously last session, you know, the, the, the state's funds were sufficient enough for us to allocate and appropriate more assets and more money towards mental health funding. And I, I'll be interested to hear some of the panelists' uh, opinions about what they're seeing, if there's fruits uh, being developed from that labor. But also from the Sunset Commission side of things, we look at whether or not these, these programs that are being developed and these policies that are being decided are actually meaningful, if they're having an effect, if they're actually producing results and good outcomes that we can measure. And, and in the mental health field, sometimes that's difficult because I feel like as, as a, a non-medical practitioner of the law, 
you know, I, I look at it, uh, I come to the legislature with a view that, you know, mental health sometimes is hard to quantify in terms of the dollars that are being spent versus the outcomes that are being realized. And I think in the past we've seen uh, some stigmas, we talked about that earlier, um, and it's hard for parents, it's hard for educators, it's difficult for folks across, uh, you know, our, our state who deal with children sometimes to feel like they can, they can step out there and, and maybe raise an issue because of, of the stigma associated with that and what that will mean for a child as they progress and matriculate through school. So I think that those are things and hurdles and challenges we may need to overcome and address. But um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, and really feel like this is an important issue that, that you know, I'm, I'm so encouraged to see a packed house and a, and a room full of folks that just raising this, these issues and talking about them is going to produce some good, good results for us. But I want to operate things a little differently on this panel. We're the only thing standing between you and lunch. So I definitely want to keep you engaged. <laughs> And um, instead of having, since we have a little bit larger panel, one extra member um, on this panel, instead of, you know, letting each person speak uh, for five minutes and then kind of getting into individual issues, I want to launch right into questions and then close uh, with a few minutes for each member for anything that we didn't discuss that you all want to talk about. We'll, we'll certainly provide some time there. But I, I do want to launch in, uh, Dr. Partap, you're, you're a practitioner, and, and so I'm going to single you out right off the bat. Um, you do tremendous work, I guess, at the foster care clinic, and, and I understand it's the only hospital-based foster care clinic in Texas. And so you not only have a, a, a wide range of experience in other states before you moved here, but you treat um, not only kids through your uh, pediatric practice, but you see a, a subset of kids that have not only physical needs, but emotional needs and mental health needs that are unique. So. What do you see that's working? Um, you use a multidisciplinary approach to your practice, and so I'm kind of interested to hear what you see, what's working, and what you think we could possibly improve on. So thanks. I am still shocked I'm up on this panel, I will tell you. Uh, with foster care, before I came to Children's Medical Center in UT Southwestern, and now I exclusively work with wonderful kids and families in foster care, I did 10 years of non-foster care pediatrics. And coming into the foster care clinic at Children's, which has been there for 20 years, I was shocked at how sick our kids are in foster care, how much they struggle. I had not cried in 10 years of doing primary care or in residency when our patients were dying. And I cried almost every day in our clinic because all of the poor outcomes we see and even the struggles they have while they're in foster care are entirely preventable and predictable. And their trauma doesn't end while they're in foster care, right? So we think, oh, we've saved you now. We've rescued you from this horrible situation. We protect you in foster care. They have everything at their disposal, and they don't stop suffering because their traumas continue every time they see their parents once a week, or there's a court decision about moving to a new person's house. And on top of that, over 60% of them have chronic medical conditions. Some of those are psychological, Some, a lot of those are physical, because if you grow up with childhood stressors, it puts into motion physical health conditions, serious ones. And so when you're working in a primary care practice, it doesn't make any sense to do a well child check for a child in foster care. What they need is every visit to be a team visit, where you're looking at their body, their mind, their family support. Is the foster care doing okay? If they're falling apart, this child's going to move in 30 days. So we've slowly added in and tried out different ways of ramping up, really embracing the whole family, along with our child welfare workers. Our CPS workers are amazing people who call these kids my child. That's what they call them when they're in foster care. And we call them my child, too. So what we did was we kind of took our experience of doing a more wraparound approach for kids in foster care, approach to reach Jones a foundation, and through a generous gift from them, we're launching foster care health centers in Dallas, Fort Worth area, to serve hopefully 3,000 or 50% of the kids in that region with an integrated model where you have primary care, behavioral health, child welfare, nurse coordinators, all working collectively in this shared team where we re help the child recover for the 12 to 18 months they're with us. That's really, really outstanding excited, work. So. I appreciate that. Chairman Raymond, you all had a hearing, I guess, in Human Services yesterday, and you probably heard some comments about foster care redesign and children's mental health issues as related to foster care. 
what uh, what is your committee focusing on and what are you uh, what are you hearing and what did you take away from yesterday's uh, committee hearing well you know I certainly welcome her comments and she sees it on a daily basis uh, and the judge to be show over here is commissioner and before that is a judge for 18 and a half years uh, dealing with a lot of these issues and you know what we're trying to do is um, is try to figure out how we can make the system better it is it is tough you know, I hope everybody in here had a, had a childhood where you, you were raised by your parents or by people that loved you and cared for you and helped nurture you and, and, and led to, to the success that has you sitting in these chairs today. Uh, but there are a lot of kids out there that aren't as lucky. And uh, um, earlier today, as I was listening to other panelists, I got to thinking, and based on some of the things that we've seen, some of the testimony that we've heard, uh, is that, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that some of the kids that are in foster care either had some mental health care issue or suffered some trauma or some, some event in their life that affected them, affected them mentally and, uh, and will affect them for a long, long time, if not for the rest of their lives. So it, it is, um, you know, the challenge for us is to try to see if we can take the responsibility that the state has, uh, has decided to many years ago to take and that we as a society have decided that we wanted to embrace, and that is to try to help these kids that fall in that category. And not, and not just to look at them as kids that just all of a sudden don't have parents and need to find a place to live, but that they have challenges that, that we don't have. If every, every one of you stop and think in your own life, if all of a sudden you got removed from your family when you were 10 years old or 5 years old or, or, or 12 years old, you weren't with your, your parents anymore, and you weren't even with a grandparent anymore, you weren't even with a relative anymore. You know, what that would be, if you can even imagine what that would be like. I was very lucky, I had my parents, I had all four grandparents into my 30s. I mean, I was a very lucky guy in that way. I look back on it, I know how lucky I was, but I know, but with my experience, how unlucky so many of these young people are. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot I want to say, but, but I'll just say one thing, we can move on, and then I really do want to take questions, I think it's a great idea. But I think that we as a society have to decide that it's, it's a priority for us to recognize that there's an issue going on out there. That when you have things like the shooting in Newtown in December of 2012, that those of us who are in politics don't pass up the opportunity that I feel that the President passed up and John Boehner and, and Mitch McConnell and all these guys up in D.C passed up an opportunity. It, you know, it wasn't to me about how many rounds you can have in a clip, you know, in a gun. It wasn't about that, but that's what the, that's what the debate became immediately. And maybe it's because I've, I've, you know, I started using guns at a very young age, so maybe I understand, you know, the dynamic of, of gun ownership. But, it, but I knew right away that it was a, about mental health care. And if the President and, and Speaker Boehner had gotten together and said, we are going to invest another $5 billion in mental health care in this country. I mean, you could have gotten Democrats and Republicans, I believe, in that moment to vote for that overwhelmingly, right? Sure. And bring more attention to what was, what's really going on. You look at most of the high-profile tragedies that we've had since I was a little kid with, you know, Whitman getting up on the tire to the guy in, the, you know, in Denver going into a theater to the guy going to Congressman Gabby Gifford's town hall meeting. You look at that and it's, and it's all about mental health care and that we as a society have not done enough, in my view, to embrace the fact that we, we have to recognize this as a serious issue, you know, and, and do all that we can from the time that they're little kids in school. I, I love listening to the, to the sheriff a little while ago, even though I'm a Longhorn and he's from Aggieland. But it's a little suspicious, by the way, that he was here at the same time we have maroon blue bonnets coming up all around the yeah, tower. But, so we want to make sure. We yes, I, you know, my, my city, I have to say, because we're UT, so my city manager, who's a good friend and big Aggie like all Aggies, calls me and reads me this story, which I hadn't seen yet, about the blue bonnets. And I said, well, I've got to go to UT. I've got to go to the campus. I've got to go find them and pull those damn things out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you raise a good point, and I want to ask Judge Specia, I mean, about early intervention and recognizing, uh, you know, a, a, a red flag or, or something to be aware of at an early stage, because I think that's where, you know, the studies have shown there's, there's you know, plenty of room for effectiveness and, and efficiencies and, and really to get the best outcomes when you, when you take action early. 
I know you all uh, at DFPS try to do the best job you can at reaching kids uh, before they enter foster care or before the juvenile justice system is involved. Um, so, you know, you've got a great perspective having been, uh, you know, an attorney that, that handled, you know, cases where you saw this from a legal perspective and as a sitting judge in Bear County for a long time and now from a regulatory and administrative standpoint. Really interested to hear your comments about what is uh, most effective, what are you all doing to reach these kids in early stage and, and prevent some of those adverse outcomes? Well, the really important thing is, is to break down the silos. Uh, uh, a program in Bear County that goes to the Center for Healthcare Services called Bear Cares, uh, we see kids very early in the child welfare process. Uh, they're not gonna be taken into custodies, but these children have mental health issues. And rather than just closing the case and then reopening it later, we're referring those cases to the Center for Healthcare Services. And the child and the family receive services there. And the whole purpose of that program, it's based on, on some legislation uh, Representative Menendez sponsored a few years ago, is to identify children early, identify the needs early, treat them and keep them out of the child welfare system. Uh, families should never have to turn to the child welfare system for mental health services. There should be services in the community, and in, in large parts of Texas, there are no services in the community, and that presents a great challenge for my agency when we identify children uh, who need services and families that need services. So I'm a huge fan of prevention. Uh, if we identify mental health issues early on, we can prevent child abuse and neglect and prevent them from ever coming into the system. That's, uh, you know, you, you raise a really good point. I was having a meeting the other day with some folks from the Texas Tech University Health uh, Science Center and the, the system there, and they, they talked about some program that they are, they are utilizing now for um, early uh, childhood intervention, and, and they said that they're educating educators and working with educators and, and trying to help them become more aware when they realize that there might be a young student that's displaying types of behaviors that, that ought to be noticed and ought to be cared for in a certain way. And, and they've actually had uh, stories where because they were able to identify some students through the teachers and, and through the school counselors and nurses who, who took action, which they said again, you know, you overcome a barrier because there's sort of a stigma involved there. But if you can if you can make them you know, more aware, um, they will do a good job and, and identify those kids. Well, in a couple of circumstances, these kids that they identified were able to have a consult with a psychiatrist through telemedicine, through a telehealth network, which you know, in, a, in an area where, for instance, my backyard up in the Panhandle, we would really utilize that to a high degree because there is a shortage of available healthcare professionals and psychiatrists. And so in rural communities, I think that's particularly important, but they were able to have a consult and in, in more than one case, it was actually life-saving. Um, they actually prevented one suicide literally at the school uh, because the psychiatrist was able to identify um, a, a, a condition or a situation that he felt had to be acted upon immediately. And by the time they reached the child at issue, um, she was she was close to taking her life with a belt under the bleachers, and it, it saved a life. And so that's miraculous, and that's something that, that you know I think is very helpful. And, and in other cases, it, it helped stop some violence. And so that's a really good I think boots on the ground where the rubber meets the road example of, of something that can be done with innovative technology, early intervention. And uh, that brings me to you, Sonia, because I want to ask you, you, you come from a background working in Tarrant County with, uh, that, that's got a tremendous track record of, of success, and so my hat's off to you in that regard. But in your new role at HHSC, what do you see uh, that, that maybe we, we could repu replicate statewide? And what, what successes did you see there that through your efforts to collaborate services and agencies talking to one another, um, what, what do you see are the biggest opportunities for us and maybe the biggest challenges? Um, I actually think there's a number of things, not just from Tarrant County, but as I visit across the state, um, there are a number of, of excellent approaches um, that I've seen in terms of intervening and, and prevention of uh, mental health challenges. And, and one of the things I want to start out by saying is that I know we're talking about uh, mental health conditions, but you know, mental health conditions really ha has no boundaries. Um, and when you think about it and when, you, when you're dealing with it, 
you're also dealing with a lot of these kids um, come from backgrounds where either they've abused substances or their families have abused substances. And that plays a tremendous role in, in what's going on. And also what's going on in the household with the family members, with, with the parents. Um, but if I can think about some of the things that I think that have been successful, certainly I'd like to start out by um, some of the initiatives that have uh, kind of crossed boundaries across our state and, and many of the counties. This last legislative session, there's been a lot of talk about the dollars that were appropriated. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have over $300 million infused into the system. Now, that's not an opportunity for us to just, you know, clap our hands and say, oh, we're done now, okay, because that, that's just the beginning. But there are a number of communities across the state that are doing um, phenomenal things. Uh, we have, you mentioned the training uh, for teachers, and uh, one of the things that's going on right now is that there is uh, something called mental health first aid training that's available throughout the state of Texas, and it's available for all educators and individuals that work within the school system. Now, this training doesn't um, give, equip people to now be mental health professionals, but it helps them to understand some of the signs and symptoms mm -hmm. um, that they need to pay attention to, and what are some of the intervention strategies that they, they can um, you know, take action to make a difference in the lives of that individual. Um, another program that that's, I'm very, very excited about uh, is the YES waiver. And right now it's in a few areas, but there is an expansion you know, across the state of, of Texas that we're looking at. What's unique about the YES waiver is that that program has the opportunity to serve individuals that historically no one else and the resources that we have that currently exist within our communities have been unsuccessful in making a, making a difference in their lives. So we're able to apply some innovative therapies, uh, things like equestrian therapy, art therapies, uh, things that are totally different than what we've ever done before. And we're seeing some amazing results from, from that sort of thing. So, so there are a number of, of really, really effective um, intervention strategies that are going on right now. Do you feel like the, the, the funds that have been allocated uh, to these strategies are actually you know, making a difference or is it too early to tell um, in this process? Well, I, I, I absolutely do believe that the funds are making a difference. I'll give you an example. Um, this time last year, we had close to 300 in children that were on a wait list. Today, there, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's even five. Okay, so the list has um, gone down substantially. We've we pretty much eliminated, and that comes from the hard work that many of the folks sitting in the audience have, have done to make that happen, because that's no easy feat. So someone might say, think 300 people, that number sounds small, okay? It's not small when you're dealing with a child that has very, very sophisticated challenges and may or may not have the kind of family support and other kind of supports that are necessary to be successful. So um, in that case, I think that we've made some tremendous strides. Um, there's a, a, whole, a whole list of other um, areas that, that we've done a tremendous job, in my opinion. But here's the thing that I'm going to say, that uh, you know, a lot of times um, when decisions are made about making changes, uh, that we think are going to make a positive impact in an area. I can tell you from my 30 years of experience of feet on the ground, working with patients, working with family members, sitting in with them, going to their homes, you know, looking at what works and what doesn't work. Um, what I understand is that, you know, when you, when you make a decision to do something, it takes time. It takes time. So I applaud, you know, our legislation for um, the decisions that were made this last session that undoubtedly have definitely made a difference. Um, we have uh, residential treatment centers uh, now that we can uh, put folks at and, and really do some tremendous intervention. Uh, I know in Tarrant County they have the one and only um, pilot site that they're looking at now for uh, child adolescent respite uh, crisis services. All of those things are making a difference, but we need time to make it work and to make it work well and then to expand that to other places throughout the state. Chairman Raymond, what kind of legislative challenge does that 
present in, in an appropriations challenge when you've got you know, a need for, for time to, to produce good outcomes and measurable outcomes. And as I mentioned in my opening comments, I think just from an outsider looking in before I actually was, was aware of how the process worked, I mean, one of the big obstacles, I think, to, to funding mental health programs is sometimes it's hard to quantify. It's not, you know, it's not as direct cause and effect as you'd like it to be on paper sometimes when you're, when you're looking at ratios and numbers and allocation of money. So what, what challenges do you think are practical challenges both legislatively and through the appropriations process as we go into the, the 84 session in January? Well, you know, so uh, Ford's been here a couple of years and, and I've been here a couple of decades. <laughs> and, you know, one that's of why the hardest, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> one of the hardest, one of the hardest uh, things in the world is to be in the legislature, and I bet many of you have testified and advocated for certain things and seen this, that to stand up there and say, if we invest in this, members, if we invest in this, members, over, over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, we'll save a bunch of money. And then the response is, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, it's very difficult, and, and Senator Nelson can tell you, uh, she's been through some of this herself, it's very, very difficult to convince members that investing in something now will save you money over the long term, whether it's the foster care system, the criminal justice system, or a public education system, or dropout rates, uh, drug usage. I want to make mention of that, that I, I'm absolutely convinced that you look at the tremendous dropout rate in the state of Texas, and you look at drug, uh, drug abuse, uh, kids that are using drugs, but many of them have, have mental health care issues, right? I'm, there's no doubt in my mind, you know? And so uh, it, it is, that continues to be the challenge. But I think, like everything, the more we bring focus to it, conferences like this, and I, I, I absolutely thank the Meadows folks for doing this, and Tom Luce for stepping up and bringing more attention to it. And I hope that you don't stop today because the more members understand and are educated and informed, then they make what I call uh, or more informed decisions. And that's what we have to work at. Uh, I'm gonna mention a couple of things that, that uh, for example, that I'm gonna push for next session. One that I pushed last year, I passed a bill in the House, died in the Senate. It was a bill that a couple of my judges, district judges, I work very close with my, closely with my district judges, who are concerned about all these young people that end up coming before them, right? who have broken the law, who have been using drugs, who are involved in drugs. So they came up with an idea, and this is a fairly simple one. It says, uh, you give parents the right to give parental consent to a school, and the, and the parental consent is you can check my kid's backpack. See, because right now you can't do that, and kids know that. You've got to have some real probable cause or suspicion <laughs> to go check their backpack. They don't have lockers anymore like we used to, right? It's backpacks. So the bill says you give the parents the chance, if they want to, they give it to them and say, you can check my kid's backpack. And if they, they catch them with drugs, what we do with this bill, they take the drugs from them, they give it to the principal, the principal calls the police, police take the drugs. They don't tell the police who that kid was. But what that kid then has to do is go get screened to see if they're addicted to drugs, to see if they have a mental health care issue, right? And if they do, to give them a chance before their lives are ruined, to give them a chance, to give them a second chance, really, right? Sure. You think that makes sense? And again, it wasn't easy, but I got it out of the house, and then, you know, interestingly, some of my very conservative colleagues were for it, and some of my very conservative colleagues were against it, and some of my, uh, yeah, anyway, it didn't pass. I couldn't get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but uh, but it is a good idea that I think with a little bit more uh, you know a little bit more educating of legislators. I had several senators that I ended up having to compromise and make this a pilot program in Laredo, Texas, and even then I couldn't pass it. But other senators were saying, "Wait a minute, I want my town in there. I want my schools too. That's a great idea." Well, one thing I, I hear from you and I, Sonia, I hear from you, Dr. Partap, really, Judge Speech, everybody at one point or the other has touched on how important it is to involve other stakeholders, collaborative efforts between, you know, with regard to kids and, and children's mental health, whether it be, you know, just from the medical side or the education side, you know, or, you know, law enforcement. You, you've got a lot of different folks who, who deal with it on different levels, but to engage them all to, to make sure that, that there's an increased awareness. 
I think is something that's kind of a common theme that everybody's hit on at one point or the other. So Judge, I want to ask you, what, what, uh, you know, what collaborative efforts are you seeing uh, you know, in, in DFPS? What are you wanting? And uh, uh, maybe Sonia can help you in her, uh, in her position at HHSC make that happen. Uh, my position on collaboration is, my direction to my staff is collaborate, collaborate, and keep collaborating. Uh, you've got to be part of the community. Uh, I learned a lot of that from the Permanent Judicial Commission, and Justice Guzman is here, but Permanent Judicial Commission brings stakeholders together quarterly to talk about serious issues, mental health issues, school issues, whatever. Uh, Sometimes state agencies like to live in their own little silo and, and just take care of their problems, and we even have that problem in the enterprise. So now Dr. Lakey and I are collaborating to keep children out of the child welfare system by providing mental health services and mental health beds uh, before they go into the child welfare system. And that was a, as a result of Senate Bill 44 in the last session. Uh, we've got a lot of resources in Texas, uh, both private and public, uh, but what, what you find is sometimes we just don't access those resources. So I always say that child welfare is not just the job of the child welfare agency, it is the community's job. And so on our prevention efforts, we're partnering with the communities. We're going in the communities and saying, what are your issues and how can we partner with you and other nonprofits in your community to address child abuse and neglect? So it's critically important that we collaborate. We're using telemedicine. Uh, for West Texas, uh, we, we've got to get good health care out there. And do you think, do you think as, as Texas becomes more urban, you know, with 26 million people statewide and most of that population growing in urban areas, will that continue to be a need that, that we see uh, amplified out in rural Texas, West Texas, Northwest Texas? I, I think so. As a judge, when we were talking about collaboration and, and getting access to, to drug and alcohol treatment programs, you've got them in Bear County but you don't have them in Medina County or Uvalde County or Atascosa County. Even as we become more urbanized, 50 miles away, there are no access. And 50 miles is forever when you don't have a car and you don't have transportation. So we really need a need for all the 254 counties to have access to services within their communities. Yeah. Not the same ones, but, but access to services. Well, access is key. As, as we you know, talked about those statistics at the beginning of this panel, uh, so many children are, are, you know, left untreated. So maybe that will help alleviate that in some regard. Dr. Partap, you know, you, you talked about your multidisciplinary approach at the clinic, and you, you have to treat not only the child, but sometimes the parent of the child, because uh, kids, I guess, are at an increased risk for mental health issues if they have a parent or parents with mental health issues. So do you treat parents? Do you all counsel parents? Uh, how do you handle that situation? I mean, before I started only working with families involved with foster care, you can never work with a child without working with a family, right? So a child is like a chameleon. And at some point, that color doesn't change. And so you're trying to catch them while you change their environment so that they're no longer just reflecting the chaos of their home. Foster care is different because now the biological families are completely separate, and which is very unfortunate because a third of them get their kids back. And then foster parents are really left raising a child who's been traumatized that they may or may not get to hang on to. And so we really focus on helping foster parents understand the needs of their child and how to hang in there for the long run, to not give up and understand they're going to trigger your emotions and it's going to happen. And, and so that's where kind of that family support piece comes in. And that's the most important unmet need right now is supporting that. That's great. Well, Sonia, how, how realistic is it uh, from what you're seeing at the agency level to involve um, not only, you know, parents in this process, educators, maybe working with TEA, mm -hmm. um, having, you know, wellness checks include mental health at the pediatric level with physicians or, or you know, things of that nature so that this early intervention and collaboration we've been discussing on this panel uh, actually takes root and has some more positive outcomes. What, how realistic is that? I, th I think it's very realistic. And if it's not realistic, we need to change people's minds about it. Um, I, I'm going to, in, in thinking about collaboration, one of the things that, that really strikes me as a, a s tremendous success over the last couple of years is some of the initiatives around the 1115 waiver. Uh, transformation waiver process and 
Um, a number of folks in here, raise your hand if you are involved in any way in a transformation waiver project. So the, the thing that's unique about that project uh, are those initiatives, and by the way, there's 76 projects that um, are either devoted to, to serving children or children are a part of that, that process. And um, the neat thing about that process and the, and, the, and the projects themselves is that it does cause entities to collaborate with one another. There's a lot of private and public collaborations uh, across systems. And so I'm seeing people doing things that they've never thought of doing before because there were no boundaries. You know, there were, they, they weren't afraid to do it. Uh, and they had the, the opportunity, the time to plan, um, the resources, an opportunity to pull in some, some really exciting folks from across, across the nation. I know there was a project, some projects that we worked on. There's opportunity to look at integrated health um, projects now where we can have physical health and mental health and substance abuse, you know, that we can look at that collectively, you know, as a group. So those projects are, are very, very meaningful. And I would imagine a couple years from now, I, I would love it, um, you know, as we start seeing some of the tremendous outcomes that come out of, out of that project, that might be the way that we need to go, you know, in the future. Well, that's, uh, that's, you know, absolutely the way I'm sure we, we need to head. And, and I know we only have a few minutes left, so I kind of wanted to to uh, leave some time so each of the panelists could, you know, comment about anything that they want to with regard to children's mental health and the issues we've already discussed. I just, it, it occurred to me as we were watching the first panel, Jake Schick, you know, it was so powerful to hear the, the Marine discuss, you know, veterans issues and his perspective and, and you know, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth and so it, it's even more uh, emotion evoking, you know, and it's, it's, it's so moving to hear it directly from him. We don't ever have that opportunity with children because you know children with mental health issues they're not up here on a stage giving presentations as part of a panel so it's up to the folks in this room and elsewhere to speak on their behalf and i'm really encouraged to see you know how much interest there is in the issue and uh i'm sorry i covered up my mic and so i uh I, i'm i'm very encouraged you know based on what we're hearing and the results that we're seeing um, Judge Specia, I just want to start with you and kind of move back down. If you'll just take a couple of minutes and um, let us know kind of, you know, what your priorities are moving forward and, and what your comments and remarks would be in closing. Well, my priorities are we need to work with all of the various systems. It has to be a holistic approach. Dr. Partap is, is absolutely right. When we have a child in foster care, we have to work with that child, body, mind, soul, and, and with that child's family. Uh, if we deal with children in isolation, we're ignoring their trauma, we're ignoring their needs. So we have to really focus on that. One thing that was brought to my attention this morning, today and yesterday at the hearing, is the special needs of the children of veterans that are returning. Uh, Fort Bliss and Fort Hood, enormous army bases where we have a very large child welfare presence. And we have to be particularly sensitive to how do we get services to those families. Uh, the military schools are having major issues. Uh, so we need to really work closely with the veterans group and, and the military to, to make sure that our services are coordinated and seamless. We're getting these families the services that they need. And so it, it's a, uh, we've got a lot of children in the state of Texas, seven million. Uh, a significant percentage, very small percentage, but a lot of children, 28,000 children in foster care on any given day, and we have to work to address those children's needs to help them become productive citizens. Uh, I'd rather spend money when they're young than spend money when they're old and incarcerated. It's a lot cheaper to work on the problems uh, uh, when they are in the foster care system and not let them graduate to the juvenile justice system and the adult uh, correction system. Well, the cost differential is dramatic, isn't dramatic. it? Dramatic. Yeah. Chairman Ring? Well, you didn't leave time for questions, but it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've heard the saying, cradle to grave, right? We have to, uh, I believe, look at it from the beginning to the end. And uh, you've already heard me say that I think we, we all have to sort of unify and, and bring more attention to this, and, and you're doing it today. But I think those of us that are legislators, uh, have to look for good ideas, different kinds of good ideas. I gave you one that I think is a good idea. 
that I believe we will get past next session. Uh, and and, and I, I'll, I'll give you two more. Um, you know, it's been brought to my attention, for example, that we don't, I already knew we don't have enough psychiatrists in the state of Texas. But that, for example, it is, if you move in from another state to the state of Texas, if you've been a psychiatrist for 10 years, 15, 20 years, that it takes a long time to get approved, certified, et cetera. We don't have reciprocity agreements with other states. Well, I guarantee you I'm doing a bill next session, or if we can put it into the, through the sunset process, if we can work that in, uh, then we ought to have reciprocity agreements with states all over this country. We can look at the, what their, you know, what their process is. We can look at their process, and if somebody, if they're, some states are tougher than ours. So if you've done, if you're already a psychiatrist in New York or California, and you, you want to come to Texas, you know, as long as you're not a criminal, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but we ought to do simple things like that that are, no, to me, no-brainers. I'm going to give you another one that, Jane, we haven't talked about this, but I've talked to other, some other members on the, on the sunset, uh, looking at, for example, state-assisted living centers. You know, I came to the University of Texas. I've been around Austin a long time. I'm familiar with the State Assisted Living Center off of 35th and Mopac. You know, it, many of the folks who were, who were there, those who say we don't need these State Assisted Living Centers at all, they're wrong. We, we will always need them, right? We need to move folks into the community where we can, that works. But there are many people, and certainly enough people, that you're not going to be able to do that. We're going to need the State Assisted Living Centers. And if we've decided, I always say this, if we've decided that that's our policy, then let's do it right. You have a tremendous asset. We know Austin is a great place. You have this tremendous asset there. It's worth a lot of money. And you have a terrible facility there. You all saw in the Statesman a couple of days ago, they're about to shut that down. We're about to lose money, millions of dollars, yet again, from the federal government. We should look at that. We should sell that. We should build something new, right? Probably between here and San Antonio, maybe serve both places. We're probably going to have money left over. We'll probably get more money there than we'll need building something new to really bring the kind of services that those people deserve and need. Use that money, leave that money earmarked only for those services. But we need to do those kinds of things and push past the politics. Anybody who tells me we shouldn't do that, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that you wouldn't want to take that asset and, and, and use it and invest it in the way that we've decided we want to to help those people in a meaningful way. So my point is, looking at everything, you all have a bunch of good ideas out here, I bet, and a bunch of them are ideas that we probably can implement if we, if we get them into the process. That's what I think we need to be doing. Well, that's a great thing about the Institute. We're getting a lot of great ideas and, and bringing them out into the forefront. I know we're running short on time. Dr. Partap? So I, the, the odd thing about medicine right now is that it's easier for me to take care of a child who I think has leukemia than it is for a child who presents with early signs of mental illness. It should never be able to be easier for me to do that for a child with leukemia. Mental health is as precious as the other child with leukemia. And to hear you all say that mental health sounds difficult, that's, that's my priority now for this year because it's very simple to take good care of children and families' mental health. We already know what works. There's lots of evidence, lots of you have great experiences, and it's just a matter of making a commitment to make mental health that simple to address every day, everywhere. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Gaines. One of the things that I would say is that, you know, we, we talked a lot about some of the strategies. Certainly coordination and collaboration is important. Um, but I have a vision that we would get to a point that intervention, prevention of services is every, every Texan's business. That we look at it as second nature. Uh, that it's just like what we used to think about, you know, many years ago people didn't wear seat belts. And we thought that was okay to throw the baby in the front seat of the, of the car. <laughs> okay, but today, none of us, if we saw that happen, we would all intervene. So wouldn't it be a wonderful Texas if we could get to the point that when we, when we saw something, when we, we saw an opportunity that we can intervene, that we would take that opportunity and make a difference in the life, life of that individual. And the final thing that I would say is that, you know, there's a lot of folks in this room today that are 
in a position of making decisions. And a lot of the decisions that we, we make today are going to be judged 20 years from now. And we're talking about children. And those of us that have children, we know that we only get one chance, OK? And there are no second chances. So we need to make that one chance count. And I think that we have the opportunity to do that in Texas. Well, it's, it's encouraging to hear that. It's encouraging. Yeah, please clap. I think yeah. that's. Uh, and I and think Representative Price, I really want to thank you for you chairing this wonderful panel. And um, we need to stop for our lunch break. Uh, our luncheon speaker is already here. I call her the boss lady. And um, <laughs> so there is no free lunch in this sense. Uh, we're going to adjourn. You go out and get your box lunch, but you have to be back seated in your seat at 1240. You can eat in here, you can eat in the hall, but you have to be back so we can hear from <laughs> Senator Nelson. And Representative, thank you so thank much. You. Next part of our program, which is uh, really, really important, but before I get to introducing our keynote speaker, I want to ask you a personal favor, and that is that after Senator Nelson leaves, there is one more portion of the program, which is Evan Smith is going to interview me, and I don't want you all to leave me alone <laughs> to be grilled in that way. So I want you here just in case I need some vocal support, okay? Now, with that, I, I am very, very pleased to introduce Senator Nelson, and aside from kind of the official info, I want to tell you that our relationship goes back 25 years when um, she was 12 years old and I was 14. Uh, we met then, and um, she was not yet an office holder, but she took my hand and helped me across the state, which was a great benefit to me, and I saw this lady is a doer, and she is a doer. I've had the personal pleasure of meeting and working with her on Alliance Airport and a lot of developments in Northwest Tarrant County and she is a doer and she's really changed the landscape of Northwest Tarrant County and Northern Dallas County and she is always uh, does what she says she will do and she's been a real bulwark in this area of mental health as you all know. Um, you know, of course, that she represents District 12, which includes uh, portions of Denton as well as Tarrant counties. Uh, she's a businesswoman and former teacher. Uh, don't get her started about discipline in the classroom. Uh, she served two terms on the State Board of Education before joining the Texas Senate. Right now, which is important to us all, she chairs the Sunset Advisory Committee and the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, uh, which you know uh, shapes the policies of our state's health care programs and, of course, mental health and behavioral health. Uh, she also serves in the Senate Finance Committee. There are various rumors about that regarding uh, Ms. Nelson, but we don't need to ask about that. That's after the election. But she's also on the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Fiscal Matters, the Senate Nominations Committee, the Senate Open Government Committee, and she's the highest ranking Republican in the Senate. And this is a lady that has been passionate about mental <clears throat> and behavioral health before it was cool. Um, she's worked on this a long time and she's very passionate about the subject and we're honored to have Senator Jane Nelson with us. Senator. Thank you, thank you, Tom. And I loved your reference to my almost being 40 years old. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here today with you all. I am so very happy to see Meadows Foundation taking on this project. I've been a longtime fan and was very excited to hear that this Policy Institute was being launched. I'm sure you're going to do great things, and I welcome your ideas. I was here, uh, watched a little bit of the previous panel, and many of the things you're going to hear me say are things that I heard them say. But you know, I am a former teacher, and they say you need to hear it three times to go from short term to long term. So this will be at least the second time that you hear them. Truly, mental health is one of the most difficult issues 
that we grapple with as policymakers. The, the level of need varies greatly from patient to patient. Those who suffer from mental illness may not recognize that they need help. And those who do get treatment, as many of you all well know, may not follow up through their, through, follow through with their treatment plan. There are civil liberty issues involved. We have multiple programs operating in silos across multiple agencies, and oh, Judge Specia, I loved hearing what you had to say. It is also a challenge for you all to demonstrate to legislators the positive outcomes that we are achieving through the investments that we make. And let me pause right here and thank everyone in this audience for what you do. I am very, very grateful for your dedication. And I have to tell you, talking about the Meadows Institute, I just feel like the planets have aligned. There, unfortunately, have been some horrible incidents take place, and it just it seems like every week we pick up the paper and read about some just horrible thing happened that clearly is connected with mental health. And you know, some of us have been talking about this for a long time, but the public is, is very aware right now. They're interested. They don't know what the solutions need to be, but, but they're paying attention, and you're going to find legislators paying attention. And I am so grateful that Tom Luce is involved. He, he will make them pay attention if they're not paying attention. And, and that the Meadows Foundation has, has chosen this as an effort to, to put a lot of uh, time and energy and finances into. Those of you who are advocates who have made your rounds around the Capitol know uh, Especially during session, you come into a legislator's office, you're lucky if you get 10 minutes. Uh, if you're in my committee sitting before me, you get three. So, uh, but, but 10 minutes to explain to a legislator, particularly one who's just getting started, n not just what's wrong with our mental health system, but what we can do to make it better. And, and I understand that's a challenge. Leading up to last session, we did have a momentum going, and I have to give credit to a lot of our mental health advocates and our law enforcement people and hospitals and judges and local governments who really spent a lot of time trying to bring mental health to the attention of legislators. You know, and, but it bears repeating. A person with mental health issues is going to present in one of just a few ways. They're going to present in a clinical setting, which of course is the preferable, in the emergency room, in jail, or in some sort of tragedy. Obviously, the first option in a clinical setting is the one that is the most efficient, it is the most cost effective, and it's the most humane way to treat mental illness. And last session, we took significant steps toward ensuring that more people get help via that option. I am so grateful to all those people, and I know a lot of you, I've talked to some of you today, who spent the time, excuse me, before session, walking the halls and knocking on legislators' door and helping educate lawmakers about this issue. It is working, and I want to ask you to keep it up. Lawmakers are growing more comfortable talking about mental health issues. There is still a stigma, a stigma surrounding mental illness, but I think we're seeing that decline. Many lawmakers obviously have family or friends who are struggling with mental health issues. We have constituents who need help. I, I have to tell you, in the past year, I've referred more people with, to, to local mental health authorities or to law enforcement than I ever have before. We've had people come into my offices exhibiting erratic behavior. We had an individual who wrote me an email who had the exact date that he was going to commit suicide. My staff has been threatened with violence, as I have, from individuals who were clearly unstable. And we see things that I talked about before that are happening in our world that are just horrifying. And in fact, 
just 25 days before last session is when Sandy Hook took place. I have to tell you, if you don't, Tom, you didn't mention in my introduction the most important thing about me, and I have five children and six grandchildren. <laughs> six grandchildren and counting. I'm a former teacher, and two of my daughters are teachers. And so what happened in Sandy Hook really had a, I mean, I was horrified, I, and, and I know everybody was. But when tragedy strikes, it is so important for us to make something good come of it. I was struck last session by the genuine concern from lawmakers on the need to address mental health. And this didn't just happen in the health and human service arena, but also through our education system, through our criminal justice system, and our programs that serve veterans. Everybody was talking about it. And you spent time this morning talking about the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, that is our largest provider in the state of mental health services. And you also discussed issues, uh, mental health issues for veterans. Sadly, you know, two weeks ago, we saw another event at, at Fort Hood that put on display once again how badly some of our veterans need access to mental health. All of our veterans need access to mental health care. In um, 2009, I had a veteran come in. My best ideas I get from people just coming in my office and saying, you need to try this. But a veteran came in my office and talked about a program that he was familiar with in another state. And uh, he, he wanted me to help him implement it in Texas. And I filed a bill. It was a great idea. It was uh, a peer-to-peer -peer counseling program for veterans at the Department of State Health Services. No one can relate to the psychological wounds of war like a fellow veteran. And it's been wonderful to see that program grow. It now has 600 volunteer counselors who are making more than 53 thousand interactions a year with their fellow veterans. You've covered a lot of the issues that I would have t talked about, and I'm glad that you had the time to, to really delve down in them, but I'm going to focus on mental health efforts within our health and human services. <clears throat> in the Senate, most of you already know this, but um, on our finance committee, we divide up into articles, and Article 2, of course, is the money that goes for health and human services, and I chaired that work group last session, and I could tell early on that we had support to take a significant step forward with mental health. In fact, we sat down and had a um, very informal meeting. We were talking, and when we got, just very first got started, we said, we're going to put money in three things. One of them is going to be mental health, and what's left over will work with everything else. Uh, they actually were mental health, women's health, and child protective services. It was important to me, though, that we didn't just fund our, that we needed to fund solutions, not problems. We were funding problems. We were putting more money. I didn't want to put more money into just doing the same thing with more money. We increased funding for mental health and substance abuse, increased it by almost $300 million. That was one of the largest investments in state history. And we targeted those resources toward three specific goals. Ensuring that individuals who were seeking care had access to the services they needed in the most appropriate settings. Reaching out to people who don't know they need help or who don't know where to find it. And making sure that we are working, Judge Specia, in a collaborative, coordinated manner that will move us toward a more cohesive and efficient system. Our Committee on Health and Human Services has been assigned an interim charge that will monitor the implementation of these new resources and ensure that these funds are having their desired impact and we're already seeing progress. For starters, and I heard it mentioned, but you're going to hear it again, we have greatly reduced our wait list. If a person is proactively seeking help, we've already won half the battle. It is important that these individuals are not waiting months for the treatment that they need. Last year, in February of 2013, there were 5,321 adults and 194 children on wait lists. And as of mid-March, 
5,715 adults and 120 children on those waiting lists have been connected to services. We are on, yes, I'll clap, we are on the path to eliminating those lists completely. And I'm so happy about that. We also, we've also ensured that more people are receiving the right care. As of last month, almost 1,500 individuals who were receiving limited services have been moved to a more appropriate level of care. We invested in supportive housing, always a challenge for individuals with mental illness. It's very difficult to focus on recovery if you're worried about keeping a roof over your head. And we hear from com communities that those efforts are making a big impact. We also expanded crisis services, allowing us to divert patients from our jails and emergency rooms more effectively. Millions of dollars, and this is another issue I heard touched on, but millions of dollars in 1115 waiver projects have been approved to provide intensive outpatient treatments to prevent individuals who are leaving the emergency room or jail from finding themselves right back there again. I'm confident as we evaluate the dollars that we invested to help individuals who recognize their mental health issues, we're going to have positive results to report. But as we saw in Sandy Hook uh, situation and others, we must work on ways to identify people with mental health issues that pose a danger to themselves or to others. And you don't have to be a mental health expert to tell when a person needs help all the time. I mean, uh, the, the old adage says, if you see something, say something. And that's something we need to help the public get involved and understand. And it's easier said than done. I mean, it's not illegal to have mental health problems. So exactly, you know, what are you reporting and to whom? And, and if, if you have a loved one, it's not easy to raise that issue with them. And concerned parties often worried that there might be some permanent black mark on a loved one's record. Last session, we helped fund a public awareness program that will attempt to educate people about that very issue. What do they do if they have a loved one or someone they know who obviously needs help? Teachers are often the first ones to note a problem with their student. But imagine how difficult that is for a teacher to raise concerns. One new initiative that was funded by the legislature last session was the mental health first, first aid in our schools. Over 11,000 educators have been trained or will be trained this year to identify the warning signs and to connect children with resources. These are positive steps and I really believe that that especially in our schools, is an area where we need better solutions. All of these issues, I mean, how do we connect services to people who either don't know they need help or don't know where to go for help? And how do we do that in a way that keeps our civil liberties intact? To me, I think it was Representative Raymond who stole my line, it is a preventive issue. If you come to my Health and Human Services hearing, you're gonna see a cup on my desk that I had made for all my members that says, prevention is the solution. The more we can do to prevent this population from sliding to rock bottom, the more effectively we can prevent people with mental illnesses from showing up in our jails, from showing up in our emergency rooms, and the greater their chances are for recovery and the less we're going to read about these potentially preventable tragedies. The other big challenge that we tried to address last session and one that we need to raise as we move forward is collaboration. All too often our mental health programs operate separately from community to community, from program to program, from agency to agency. We need more collaboration. And I'm so happy to hear that word already being uttered here. You're going to hear that a lot from me. And um, our new associate commissioner uh, for mental health coordination you heard from today, Sonia Gaines, is really focusing on that very thing, on building 
connections and fostering collaborations between many state agencies and groups that deal with mental health issues. We also passed Senate Bill 58 that was a bill that I authored to bring behavioral health services into Medicaid managed care. We know that we get better outcomes when behavioral health is delivered in coordination with other health care and this change is going to expand our provider network, providing more integrated care and assuring that cost certainty, ensuring cost certainty for the states. We need that. While it's obvious that we made significant strides last session, we have so much work to do. First, we've got to ensure that initiatives that were funded last session are truly making the impact we envisioned. As I said before, we need to be funding solutions, not problems. How will we know that that $300 million that we invested is actually making a positive impact in communities across the state? You all sitting out there are the eyes and ears to make sure that every last penny that is being used to produce positive outcomes for our mental health system are being spent wisely and are being effective. Second, we've got to continue to break down the walls between agencies and stock stakeholders and community partners. The whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. And finally, we must work together to identify and create a better mental health system for our state. Here's what that system's gonna look like to me. Every person who needs mental health services has access to them. Every parent, teacher, family member, and friend knows how to help a person in need. Society treats mental health like any other medical disease without the stigma that is so often found today. And finally, we identify and treat people at the earliest stages possible so that they have the greatest chance for recovery. I truly believe that this institute was created in the right place at the right time. We are on the cusp of major changes to our mental health system. And I so look forward to working with you as we embark on this next phase of our journey. And I want to close by thanking you all so much in advance for all the hard work that you're getting ready to put in. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Nelson, I can't thank you enough. That's just a wonderful way to inspire us with your vision of what we should aspire to. And thank you so much for what you've already done and what you will do. Thank you so much. <laughs> Evan, um, we want to close by kind of wrapping up. And I've asked Evan Smith to join us from the Texas Tribune. As you all know, he um, has created a new uh, institute himself that's just had a tremendous impact on media coverage and press coverage of Austin and uh, it's a site to go see and we're very pleased and honored to have Evan with us today. Thank you Tom. Good. Uh, Tom, thank you. Everybody, hello, welcome. Uh, glad to see you and I want to take your invitation to be here to wrap uh, by observing that uh, a lot of progress has been made. You heard that from uh, Chairman Nelson, previous panels. And in a moment when a lot of progress is to be made or has been made, the tendency in some cases is to take your foot off the gas. But I, but I believe, believe that when a lot of progress has been made, that's when you gun the engine. So this is an opportunity now, having the momentum of the last session behind us, going into another session to gun the engine. And the creation of the Institute is one mechanism to do that. So what happens now? That's really the question. So a lot of good talk today, a lot of productive talk, a lot of big thinking. But as a practical matter, what happens now? Well, um, one, I agree with you. The answer is, what do we do from here? Because, uh, you know, if we have a conference and even if people leave enthusiastic, uh, what action are we going to take right. and what are we going to accomplish? Right. From my perspective, uh, I think it was keyed by Senator Nelson's kind of closing remarks about 
what would she like an ideal system to look like? I think now is the time to raise our eyesight a little bit and say, what does it really mean to have an integrated health care system? What does it really mean to take care of physical needs and mental needs? And now's the opportunity to paint that vision, and people in this room can help us paint that vision. But we've got to build the support from all over the state. People, uh, as Jane Nelson again said, we have to explain to legislature, this looks like such an overwhelming issue. We have to go in and say, no, let us tell you what can be accomplished. Uh, and that's an important step, and we do that through building a strong coalition across the state that can explain to the legislature what does work, because they are faced with enormous choices and a lot of issues, and we can't just say to them, uh, just keep increasing the amount of money you're spending across the board. That just doesn't usually work. So the coalition you're talking about is some combination, and we see this on a lot of public policy issues these days, public and private, state and local, insiders and outsiders, experts Absolutely. and just mere stakeholders who may not have the expertise but have the motivation to see some progress. And we have to bring them all together. Like right. you saw today, you saw sheriffs and chief justices. I yeah. mean. They, they, they provide different roles, but we have to show that we can, quote, collaborate and come together for an ideal system. I want us to help, with your help, I want us to paint the vision of what we could accomplish. Right. And then we gotta be smart enough to say, okay, but what's that gonna require in terms of workforce requirements? How do we have to change medicals? Let's yeah. talk about integrated healthcare. I, I wonder if there's a single medical school in our state that has changed the curriculum of how they train a primary care doctor. Well, you're fixing to build two, and you know it might be interesting on the front end of that process to think about some kind of area of specialization that would be directed in this way. I hear what you're saying about the various people who are on stage today. I think everybody agrees on the destination. Nobody is for mental illness, right? The question is not the destination. The question is the road you take to get there. And, and clearly within panels today and outside of this conference, different people would view getting to the destination differently, right? Different roads. So, so talk about that. How, how do you litigate the, dis, the differences between the different roads to the same destination? Well, I think you, from our standpoint, we're gonna do that through evidence, through research. We want to be the gold standard that says, let us show you the data. You've heard several speakers uh, today talk about the difficulty of, of measuring um, outcomes. Well, of course that's difficult, but policymakers need to struggle with that. So what evidence do we present them to make, they do make choices. Yeah. So it may not be the gold standard, but what's the bronze standard? What, what should we be saying we should emphasize? What should we scale? One of the things that I feel so strongly about is, listen, it is so important when you reach a single person but if you have hundreds of thousands of people that need to be reached in this state, the only way you accomplish that is by changing the sy system in which everybody works. You but, have to reach scale. But, but Tom, as you know, because you're a veteran of these wars, getting something done at the legislature on a grand scale is a little bit like turning a steamship. You know, this is not- The Queen Mary. It's not an institution, or, or better said, it's not an institution that pivots quickly. It's not built to pivot quickly. In some ways, it's a check on pivoting too quickly for it to pivot as slowly as it does, so you so you so you've got so you've got a a, 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 a a steep climb to to have an impact in a short time frame. I, I appreciated what the senator said. I do not have one of her prevention cups, yeah. but there's no there's no question that the the message is the correct. legislature has too often on this issue and others been reactive when it needs to be proactive. Getting to the problem in advance of it becoming a problem is obviously ideal to waiting until it's so late that you now have to react to something. So, and, so the, 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 the institutional barriers to doing things quickly or to being nimble in that building are something that you're now gonna have to deal with. What do you do about that? Well, because we also, and I think this has to be part of our mission, we have to bring the public demand that this happen. Just like happened in AIDS and just like happened in breast cancer, you have to create the public opinion environment yeah. that says this is not just an issue among providers. 
Right. This is not just an issue among stakeholders. This is an issue for everybody. And therefore, we need every kind of Texan to kind of raise their hand and yeah. say, no, this impacts everybody. So this is like a political campaign. Really. It, you're, you're, it it's, a, it's, it's an organizing effort. You mentioned breast cancer and AIDS. I'm thinking much more recently about standardized testing. Yeah. The reality is that happened because people all over the state, without regard to ideology or party, picked up pitchforks and torches and effectively, between the 2011 and 2013 sessions, marched on the Capitol, and the legislature heard because there were so many people who were engaged in that effort to say, we think this needs to be changed. So in some ways, you're building a campaign like that. Well, Pitchforks and torches. Yeah, l let me say this. I would, I would avoid the use of the word fire torch. However, <laughs> what, I would say, what I would say is in a democracy, you get what you deserve. Right. And that's, that's sometimes a good message and a bad message. And what we need to articulate is that there is a change in public opinion. We're no longer willing right. to ignore this issue. We're no longer willing to just have it be the province of experts. We realize as Texans, this impacts everybody, right. every family. And therefore, we want to change that ship's path Right. In a faster way. Yeah. And because now, we have to. Now, of course, you, you heard the senator say quite correctly that even in a state with finite resources and where the tendency, even in good times, is to fiscal conservatism, a bunch of money did go back into mental health last session. Thank God for that, right? But going into the next session, there will be the same competing priorities. And we have a very fast growing state. We are straining under the weight of our success in all the social and physical infrastructure areas that we all know are in the state budget. We're victims in some respects of our own success. The composition of the population is changing as rapidly as the size of our population, bringing with it a whole new set uh, of, of challenges. And, and you know, th this legislature is, is looking from the elections we've seen so far like it's going to be significantly more conservative the 83rd is going to seem like the Politburo compared to the 85th, the 84th. <laughs> well, and, and so I suspect me, that the tendency to not want to spend a whole lot of money needlessly is going to be greater in the next session than it was in the last session. So how do you combat, even if we all agree that there's a problem to be solved, how do you combat that, those realities going into a session? By examples such as the panel we had on Smart Justice, where we had C, Triple P, and Texas Public Policy Foundation. In league on the same page, nodding right. their head to yep. each other. Because let me tell you something, mental health and mental illness does not respect social economic lines, racial lines, ethnicity. It cuts across Or ideology, all, right? Or ideology. Uh, uh, the, yeah. Cuts across all, yeah. it's non-discriminatory. Right. And it reaches everybody. And we need to galvanize everybody that this has to right. change. And let me say this. Yes, always a legislature is dealing with competing priorities. But the priority in Texas and what makes us different is our human capital. It's our people. And we are wasting our greatest asset by not helping people who need help. Yeah. We no longer can have a health care system that treats mental health and mental illness on an emergency room basis yep. and physical health on a preventive basis. That doesn't work. Right. And that's a fundamental shift that we need to communicate right. that we need prevention and we need earlier treatment. We need better diagnostic tools. And we need to demonstrate that you can help people have a better life. This is not a problem where you can't make a difference. T Tom, you mentioned that physical health is, is, is being dealt with in a preventive way, health in an emergency room uh, way. There are people in the state who would tell you that actually physical health is being dealt with increasingly in an emergency room way. Uh, absolutely. We can, you, know, it, we, you and I have talked about this. We like in Texas to be first at everything. I'm not sure we want to be first in this, but we are famously first in the number of people without health insurance, and that doesn't count all the people who are underinsured. So how does that component of it uh, of, of life in Texas, of the reality of Texas, factor into the conversation we're having well, as you let, attempt to do your work. Let, let, me, let me say this. I happen to be, at this point in time, a, a guy who says the glass is more than half full in this regard. Yeah. Um, Texas can be a model of how to produce an integrated health care system. 
you can't say to me, well, Michigan's already doing this and Florida's already doing it. I mean, look, everybody across the country is coming to the realization that you cannot treat people either this way down or this way up. You have to treat medicine to the whole person. And we can be a leader in that. This is doable. Yeah. And you and don't think even under the challenge circumstances no. we have in terms of the people who do and do not have insurance in this state, we still think we get Listen, it done? I'm gonna be advocating that we provide the help they need, whether it's insurance, not insurance, community clinic, yeah. I, you know, I don't care. My goal is to make sure right. that every person gets the help they need, when they need it, and where they need it. Right. And that's, we have to do that as a state, and we have to do it as a society. So what does the Institute, as a practical matter, what does the Institute do? You have stakeholders in this, and advocates in this room who have been at this for a long time. Theoretically, you're not gonna overrun the people who are in this room. You're gonna bring them into the effort that you're gonna, uh, you're gonna be engaging in. I wanna say lead, but you may not no, view yourselves in no. necessarily a leadership role. Not a le Listen. We, what we did to the Meadows Foundation did, even yeah. before I was in board, was to have town hall meetings. I think it was ended up yeah. being 38 locations across the state to talk to people on a local basis to find out what we needed. My approach to state policy is you have to find what's working yeah. on a local basis, and then you have to identify are there barriers in state policy or regulatory policy that prevent that from being scaled if so, remove those barriers. Is there a way to change our funding formula to incentivize best practices? Maybe we have disincentives to better practices. You have to find out what's working and then figure out how can the state encourage that to be done at scale. Yeah. That's doable. Yeah. And that's how policymakers approach it. They can't know everything right. that happens in Laredo, but we've got to free people in Laredo and Del Rio but we need to encourage them to do best practices. What kind of a financial commitment will be behind the work of the Institute in the short term? Well, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to say just in a short period of time, we have secured pledges of over $20 million of private funding to launch right. this Institute. It helps to go out of the gate. With, <laughs> right. That's not a bad way to come out of the gate. Right. right. Good. And, uh, and we're gonna have 10 cups and a collection plate at, well, at the this doors is, when you This leave. is when you say yeah, lock the yeah, doors. Yeah, right? lock yeah. the doors. Uh, pa pass the plate around now. But the fact is though, that's a significant commitment from one of the leading philanthropic entities in the state. Well, not and, just and, one, and, multiple and, people, and, and, multiple and organizations. And the reality is that, you know, if you're gonna kick off an effort like this that is so large in scope and in ambition, it helps to have resources in the bank. Absolutely, right. and it helps to have and this is being live streamed across the state. Let me tell you the other thing. We all know, and I don't want to get into the theological discussion about uh, healthcare.gov or anything else. We know healthcare is going through a lot of changes right now. It is easier to bring about systemic change when change is occurring as opposed to a status quo environment. Uh, chaos is the best time to get something done. It weirdly. is, That's it right. is. And we're, we, we are dealing with how to restructure our health care in this country. Right. And mental health ought to be a part of that discussion. Right. Does the, uh, ask one or two more and then we'll let you sure. go off into the world. Does, we're, we're, gonna, we're getting ready to turn over the mulch of state government in January for the first time in more than a decade. We're gonna have a whole new cast of characters or nearly, we'll know, shortly if it's, if it's all or most, cast of characters run in this state. Some people have actually not been in positions of state leadership before. So you've got an interesting opportunity to educate those people, as well as people in the pink building, kind of in the agencies and the statewide offices, you have opportunity to educate the, the, those folks. How, you, you come to the table again as a veteran of, of many political fights, you know a lot of these folks. How, how do you best engage this new cast of characters to see that they need to play a role in this conversation as well. With a lot of help and friends from across the state. But yeah. this again is an opportunity. We are changing generations of leadership and the younger generation of the public, not just leadership of the public, yeah. has a much more uh, free feeling about saying, no, I can discuss mental illness, you know? I." <laughs> I, I grew up when you even discussed breast cancer. Right. I can discuss mental illness. 
So we need to take advantage of the generational change in leadership right. and in public opinion, but you have to paint people a vision of what we should aspire to. And I see that as part of the mission of the Institute. Yeah. What, what is the kind of healthcare system every Texan needs and deserves? You and we ought to be part of that debate. You bring up a good point that actually the generation of people coming up right now, the millennials or whatever we're calling them, actually have different attitudes about a whole host of issues. Mental health may very well be one, and that may actually force the kind of change in public perception you're talking about. L last question. You have er more than earned the right to be uh, at the La Jolla Tennis Club or on a deer <laughs> lease or, or someplace. Uh, you're a little bit like, I'm a baseball fan, it may not resonate for most people, but like the old uh, baseball player Manny Mota who would occasionally be brought off the bench out of retirement to pinch hit one time. You know, Manny's you know? only 44. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> my memory of Manny Mota is that he was a lot older than that. Okay. But the idea here is that you, you're, you know, you've decided to re-enter this public space and nobody made you and you'd be forgiven for not. So what was it exactly that got you off the bench back in uniform one last time? Well, I'm, I'm like uh, every Texan. Uh, I, mental illness has uh, impacted my family. Um, my mother was um, diagnosed when I was 24 years old as paranoid schizophrenic. And she was a single parent mother. She raised two of us without a benefit of a college education. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a next door neighbor who was like a surrogate father to me who kind of held my hand through that process and um, helped me deal with that situation and helped her deal with that situation. And uh, we were able to get her some help and she was able to watch um, her children grow up and her grandchildren grow up yep. and lead um, a, a productive life. And uh, not every Texan has that, um, uh, the same opportunity I did. And um, it's personal for you. It, it's personal, but it's also, I also, I love this state and I've studied this state a long time. And um, I, I really think that what makes Texas unique is its people. And if we don't take care of our people, then we're no longer gonna be unique. And um, this is a unique opportunity. And um, I've once again flunked retirement, but those things, uh, you well, know, I mean, if you're gonna we flunk, didn't have no pass, no play, you know, I, here's, I just flunked. If you're gonna flunk retirement, this yeah. is a pretty good way to flunk it. Let's just say that. So, uh, Tom, thank you. And obviously, everybody in this room and outside this room wishes you and the Institute the best. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you so much for your support. And we look forward to working with you in the, in the days and weeks and months ahead and the years ahead to make a difference in Texas. So thank you and thanks again to our wonderful founding sponsors. Thank you.